the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, Katie Weaver tells us how and why scientists are studying the dogs that still live in Chernobyl, Ukraine. Brian Lynn presents this week's science report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Katie Weaver. More than 35 years after the world's worst nuclear accident, the dogs of Chernobyl, Ukraine, live among empty buildings in and around the closed nuclear center. The animals continue to find food, mate, and survive. Scientists hope that studying the dogs can teach humans about new ways to live in severely difficult, unforgiving environments. The researchers published a genetics study recently in the magazine Science Advances. It centers on 302 dogs living in a government-identified exclusion zone around the area of the disaster. The area has dangerously high levels of radiation. The scientists identified dog populations that received different levels of radiation. The research found genetic differences among the dog groups that make them different from one another and other dogs in other parts of the world. Genetics expert Elaine Ostrander with the National Human Genome Research Institute is one of the study investigators. She said the scientists had a great chance to examine a situation that could help answer an important question. How do you survive in a hostile environment like this for 15 generations? Tim Mousseau is a professor of biological sciences at the University of South Carolina and a member of the study team. He said the dogs provide an incredible tool to look at the impacts of this kind of a setting on mammals. Chernobyl's environment is fierce. On April 26, 1986, an explosion and fire at the Ukraine power plant released huge amounts of radioactivity into the atmosphere. Thirty workers were killed immediately. Later deaths from radiation poisoning are estimated to be in the thousands. Researchers said most of the dogs they are studying appear to have ancestral ties to family dogs left behind when their owners fled the danger. Mousseau has been working in the Chernobyl area since the late 1990s. He began collecting blood from the dogs around 2017. Some of the dogs live in the power plant. Others are about 15 kilometers or 45 kilometers away. At first, Ostrander said, the team thought the dogs might have mated so closely over time that they would be much the same. But the testing of their genes showed that the dogs lived in areas of different radiation levels, low, middle, and high. It was a major finding. Ostrander said the scientists could identify families 
of about 15 different dog groups. Now researchers can begin to look for changes in genetic structures among the groups. We can compare them and we can say, okay, what's different? What's changed? What's mutated? What's evolved? What helps you? What hurts you? At the DNA level, Ostrander said. Scientists said the research could have wide uses. It could show how animals and humans can live now and in the future in areas under continuous environmental attack and in the high radiation environment of space. Carrie Eckenstead is an animal doctor and professor at Purdue University in Indiana, who was not involved in the study. She said the study is a first step toward answering important questions about how higher-level radiation affects large mammals. For example, she said, is it going to be changing their genomes at a rapid rate? Scientists have already started on additional research. It will require more time with the dogs in the area, about 100 kilometers from Kiev. Mousseau said he and his teammates were there most recently last October and did not see any war activity. Mousseau said the team has grown close to some dogs. Even though they're wild, they still very much enjoy human interaction, he said, especially when there's food involved. I'm Katie Weaver. Several new studies confirm the success of a test by the American space agency NASA to crash a spacecraft into an asteroid. The studies suggest the experiment was an important first step in learning how spacecraft might be able to protect Earth from asteroids or other space objects that might threaten the planet. NASA carried out the operation last September with the DART spacecraft. It crashed into an asteroid called Dimorphos, a small moonlet that orbits a larger asteroid, Didymos. The crash happened about 11 million kilometers from Earth. NASA reported in October that it considered the test a success because the force of the crash changed the path of the asteroid. Now several new studies are confirming the effectiveness of the experiment. A team from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Laurel, Maryland, examined data about the mission that NASA describes as the world's first planetary defense test. But the asteroid targeted in the mission never presented a threat to Earth. Satellites and powerful telescopes observed DART's crash into the asteroid. The goal of the crash was to see how it might redirect the asteroid's path and speed. Before the hit, Dimorphos was completing one orbit around Didymos every 11 hours and 55 minutes. The latest results showed the crash reduced this orbital period by 33 minutes. This is one minute more than NASA first announced after examining data from the crash in October. 
The DART test was phenomenally successful, said planetary scientist Tariq Daly of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. He added that the experiment proved the impact method could be used to prevent an asteroid from crashing into Earth if one day we had the need to. The studies, which recently appeared in the publication Nature, examined many different elements involved in the crash experiment. These included a major study of the impact itself and looking closely at crash timelines and investigating how the targeted asteroid changed size and shape. The researchers said one of the most important findings was that the asteroid's travel path was not just affected by being struck by the DART spacecraft. The space object's speed and direction were also greatly influenced by materials released by the asteroid after impact. The researchers said the impact by the DART spacecraft led to a recoiling effect of the asteroid. When something recoils, it moves suddenly in reaction to a force. A large amount of material from the asteroid was observed after impact, the team reported. This recoiling effect, caused by materials being released into space after the crash, gave the object additional momentum, the team reported. The researchers reported the impact caused an immediate slowing in the targeted asteroid's speed. The additional momentum Dimorphos picked up from the release of materials was far greater than the spacecraft impact itself, they added. The researchers noted the experiment showed that such operations can be carried out on asteroids that have not been studied in depth before. What is required, however, is enough warning time to prepare for a specific mission. The team said that, ideally, scientists will need several years of lead time to study any asteroids identified as a threat to Earth. The scientists noted DART's impact had turned Dimorphos into an active asteroid. An active asteroid is one that orbits like other asteroids, but has a trail of material following it, like a comet. Some scientists had in the past proposed the idea that some active asteroids are the result of impact events. But until the DART experiment, no one had observed an actual activation. Daly of the Applied Physics Laboratory said no known asteroids currently present a threat to Earth. But he added that the latest studies support the need for more research to prepare for such a possibility. Daly made a comparison to testing a car's airbags. You make sure they work during a crash test instead of waiting to get in a real car accident to find out if they work, he said. I'm Brian Lynn. Brian Lynn joins me now to talk more about this week's science report. Thanks for being here, Brian. Of course. Glad to be here, Ashley. Your report looked at several new studies that provided more detailed information about NASA's mission last year that crashed a spacecraft into an asteroid. Do the new studies contain any surprising findings? 
Well, first of all, I'll note that NASA had already declared the mission a success a few weeks after it happened. That came after the space agency had collected and examined early data on the crash by its DART spacecraft. But the new studies included a lot of results discovered in deeper examinations in recent months. What are some of the important findings included in the latest studies? The researchers said one of the most important things they learned was how the impact from the spacecraft also resulted in some material being released from the asteroid, and this created additional momentum. Um, the way something continues to move for the asteroid after the crash, and the amount of momentum created was somewhat surprising to the team. And I know the report said the crash created an active asteroid. What is this? An active asteroid is one that has a trail of material following it, and in this case, it's the material released during the crash, but it now stays with the asteroid in space. So the researchers said this was the first time the process of activation had actually been observed in an asteroid. Okay. Well, thanks again for joining me today, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website. LearningEnglish.voanews.com. Welcome to the making of a nation, American history in VOA Special English. In 1914. Europe exploded into the First World War. It was a war no nation really wanted, but no nation seemed able to stop it. The assassination of Austria's Archduke Franz Ferdinand in the city of Sarajevo was the spark that set off the explosion. Harry Monroe and Kay Gallant tell about the war and how it affected the United States. Under President Woodrow Wilson, the Austrian Archduke was murdered by Serbian nationalists. They opposed Austrian control of their homeland. After the assassination. Austria declared war on Serbia. One of Serbia's allies was Russia. Russia agreed to help Serbia in any war against Austria. Austria had allies too. The most important was Germany. Germany wanted Russia to stay out of the war. When Russia refused. Germany declared war on Russia. Then, Germany declared war on Russia's close ally, France. Britain entered the war a few days later, when Germany violated the neutrality of Belgium. One nation after another entered the conflict to protect its friends or to honor its treaties. Within a week, most of Europe was at war. On one side were the Central Powers, Germany and Austria-Hungary. On the other side were the Triple Entente allies, France, Britain, and Russia. Many other nations took sides. Bulgaria and Turkey joined the Central Powers. Italy, Romania. Portugal and Greece joined the Allies. 
the United States hoped to stay out of the war. President Wilson immediately declared American neutrality. He said, It is a war with which we have nothing to do, whose causes cannot touch us. Most Americans agreed with President Wilson. They did not want to get involved in the fighting. However, many found it difficult to remain neutral in their hearts. Some Americans had family roots in Germany. They supported the Central Powers. A greater number of Americans had family roots in Britain or France. They supported the Allies. Yet the official American policy was neutrality. The United States planned to continue to trade with both sides. Germany and Austria expected a quick victory in the war. They were caught between two powerful enemies, Russia and France. But German military leaders were not worried. They had a battle plan they were sure would succeed. The German generals planned to strike quickly at France with most of the German army. They expected to defeat France in a short time and then turn to fight Russia. In this way, the German army would not have to fight both enemies at the same time. At first, the plan worked. Two million German soldiers swept across Belgium and into France. They rushed forward toward Paris, hoping for a fast victory. But the German commanders made a mistake. They pushed their men too fast. When British and French forces struck back outside Paris, the tired and worn German soldiers could not hold their positions. The battle was fierce and unbelievably bloody. In the end, the Germans were forced to withdraw. The German withdrawal gave the Allies time to prepare strong defenses. There was no chance now for a quick German victory. Instead, it would be a long war, with Germany and Austria facing enemies on two sides. Britain and France were on the west. Russia was on the east. The Allies took immediate steps to reduce Germany's trade with the rest of the world. The British Navy began seizing war supplies found on neutral ships sailing toward German ports. It then expanded its efforts to block food exports to Germany. The blockade by Britain and the other Allies was very successful. Germany faced possible starvation. Its navy was not strong enough to break the blockade with surface ships. Its only hope was to break the blockade with another naval weapon, submarines. Germany announced that it would use its submarines to sink any ship that came near the coast of Britain. The threat included ships from neutral nations that tried to continue trading with the Allies. The United States and other neutral nations immediately protested the German announcement. They said it was a clear violation of international law. When a German submarine sank a British ship in the Irish Sea, one of the victims was an American citizen. A few weeks later, an American oil ship was damaged during a sea battle between British Navy ships and a German submarine. Then came the most serious incident of all. It involved a British passenger ship called the Lusitania. 
The Lusitania was sailing from New York City to Britain when it was attacked by a German submarine. The Lusitania sank in 18 minutes. 1,200 persons were killed. 129 were Americans. The sinking of the Lusitania shocked and horrified the American people. They called it mass murder. They turned against Germany. President Wilson warned that he might declare war on Germany if Germany continued to sink civilian ships. Germany did not want war with the United States. It already faced a strong fight against the European allies. It promised not to sink any more civilian ships without warning, and it offered regrets for the Lusitania incident. President Wilson accepted Germany's apology. Like most Americans, he hoped to stay out of the bloody European struggle. And he also knew that the record of the Allies was not completely clean. For example, he was troubled by reports of mass hunger in Germany. He and other Americans felt the British food blockade was cruel. They also were shocked by the way British forces brutally crushed a rebellion in Ireland at the time. Most of all, the American people were sickened by reports of what was happening on the battlefields of Europe. The armies were using poison gas and other terrible weapons. Soldiers on both sides were dying by the millions. The war had become a bloodbath. The United States had a presidential election in 1916. President Wilson won the nomination of the Democratic Party to seek re-election. Democrats around the country shouted their support with these words, He kept us out of war. Wilson himself did not like the words. He felt it raised false hopes but people continued to say it because they did not want war. The Republican Party nominated Supreme Court Justice Charles Evans Hughes as its candidate for president. Hughes was a moderate Republican. He supported a number of social reforms. Like Wilson... Hughes promised to keep the United States neutral. However, one of his supporters was former President Theodore Roosevelt, and Roosevelt called for strong American policies that could lead to war. Roosevelt's words led many Americans to see Wilson as the candidate of peace and Hughes as the candidate of war. Voting in the presidential election was very close. At first, it seemed Hughes had won. He went to bed on election night, believing he would be America's next president. But voting results later that night confirmed Wilson as the winner. The election was so close, the Republicans did not accept defeat for two weeks. Woodrow Wilson had won another term. During that term, he would find it increasingly difficult to honor the words of the campaign, he kept us out of war. Finally, he would find it impossible. The United States entered World War I while Woodrow Wilson was president. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. 
And I'm Dan Novak. 